Okay, greetings, brethren. Welcome to another edition of Shepherd's Voice Magazine on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. So here's some news. Um, the Another edition of Shepherd's Voice Magazine uh, just got mailed out today. Yeah, it's, it's going out a little bit late. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's the winter 2023 uh, is the is the designation for this this issue it's been a few years since we were able to produce one since we got more into the internet or the uh internet realm of production but uh the uh, we had a little trouble getting it out this year uh seems that things at the post office have changed somewhat for periodic mailing so we're actually sending it not through periodic mailing we're actually sending it through a higher class of mail, and it turned out to be not that much more expensive. However, we've um, found that uh, the postal rates have gone up quite a bit. I, I think the United States Postal Service, they were losing money, so they kept on hiking rates. So everything got more costly, and things got more costly to print uh, over the last few years. So that was a bit of a surprise. So it's going out just a little bit later than we had hoped, but it's going out. It's still going out during what is technically still winter. So um, watch for this in, in your in your mailboxes. And if you haven't subscribed, uh, go ahead and go online and subscribe uh, to get a physical copy. We'll get it to you somehow. Uh, so there's a, some challenging articles in here. And we we'll hope that it'll be a, a blessing to you when you get a chance to read it. It's also a couple of the articles are also on the Shepherd's Voice magazine uh, um, web page. So feel free to go there and do that. But I'd just like to thank people that have supported us. It was extra cost this year in, in getting it out. And I just want to thank the the donors and, that have stepped up this recently and also uh, also in the past that have helped make this, uh, this work possible. And so I just want to extend that appreciation. And if anyone, if anyone wishes to donate, donate, you can always just mail something or... Go online. There's a there's a PayPal button in case anybody's interested in, in doing it that way. Just just want to mention it, and if if not, that's fine too. No, it's not it's not a problem. Uh, but we do. I just needed to extend my appreciation to those who support this work by any means, by prayer and by feedback, and, and just being a friend is is great. So thank you. Uh, I speak on behalf of everyone who's been uh, involved in this in this work, the editors, the people who've helped edit this, the magazine. That takes a lot of work. There's always one more little mistake. If I'm, you just find it at the last minute, and then you'll be able to correct it. So, lots of effort. And again, anyone who uh, supports this by uh, by any means, uh, I want to extend my sincere thanks. All right, so let's get started with this message for today. And I'm going to ask a question. You know, I'm going to try to phrase it properly. Uh, and the question I have, is it wrong or and or inappropriate for a believer to express their disappointment in God? Or how the, the believer might even be angry with him? Can a believer express their anger towards God? God himself. Is that possible? Is it inappropriate and wrong? Let's explore the question. Let's not make any conclusions too fast. Let's explore this. Now, there was this Orthodox Jewish psychologist. His name is Michael Milgram, and he had a paper. And his paper was entitled Trauma, Anger, and Confronting God. And he makes an interesting statement. A couple of interesting statements that I want to explore. It's worth exploring. Now, the background is, <laughs> I want to note that he comes from the standpoint of all the suffering Jews have endured in the 20th century in particular. And there is this prophetic significance to that he doesn't quite understand, but that's not something I want to, to, to get into. It's something between God and the Jewish people. And so it's not something I want to comment on. But he point, this is what he pointed out that caught my attention. He says, as a therapist, because he's a therapist, I know that anyone in, in a love relationship will experience anger, at least now and then. Why should it be any different in our relationship with God? 
I thought that was an interesting statement worth exploring. So that caught my attention. And additionally, he points out, anger is a common response to suffering. I can't argue with him. He, he knows and understands this more than me, because he's probably dealt with human condition a lot more as a, as a therapist, when people come in and, and, and pour themselves out to, to somebody who is a professional. Moreover, he says, God wants us to offer him our wounded souls with all their ugly realities, including our anger. So I just want to repeat that. He says, God wants us, or even expects us, to offer him our wounded souls. Just come to him as we are, with all our hurts, and with all our with all the confusion that just comes up to my mind, and all the bewilderment, and with all their ugly realities, as he says, and there are a lot of ugly realities, including our anger. He wants, he's saying that God wants us to do that. And he says that that is a real relationship. And it is the only path to real healing, spiritual or otherwise. So, I thought, you know, that's worth exploring. And I'm trying to look at it from the Christian perspective. I'm looking at it from, of course, the, the entire Bible perspective. And we understand that God, Jesus Christ, is saying yesterday, today, and forever, I am the Lord your God, I do not change. So I think we're dealing with the same God as I'm obviously. So I just want to put that there to flatten this, to flatten out the discussion. So there are believers who think struggling with God's who are who think struggling with God's ways, who think that they're looking at it is is it appropriate? And they're, and they're saying, no, we should never we should never be struggling with God's ways, or we should be never expressing our disappointments towards God. And they don't. They believe that questioning God, for example, or doubting Him, is impious or irreverent. It's not respecting God. You should never go to Him and express Him, express anger towards Him. You should never ever express any doubt or bewilderment as to what is doing and questioning Him on His. Uh, way he operates they say that's just it's uh, it's 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 just no we can't do that so our god is perfect but i'm not talking about whether our god is perfect or not our god is we're talking more about relationship and the perfect being working with imperfect beings where he wants an intimate relationship with so how do we bridge the gap is really what we're exploring. Yet it seems to me, after looking at various scriptures that I haven't put together in my in my mind, and you might have others of your own, it seems to me it is rather expected by God for us to come in, come to Him and question Him, and expressing our anger, for example. It almost seems rather expected, even welcomed by God. Why not? Because it could lead, if it leads to positive outcomes for both the believer and especially God himself. We want a positive outcome. We're not looking for a negative outcome. The believer comes. We think of Habakkuk, for example, who had to deal with it. We, we won't go into his story. He's unique because he was the only prophet to actually initiate the discussion with God as opposed to the other prophets, it was the other way around. So, in Psalm 44, and I've talked about this psalm in more detail before, I think it's a rather unique psalm of of all of them uh, in Psalm 44, and I'm conveniently turned here right now. Now, I did discuss this in more detail in a previous sermon in in 2020, and I think think it it was entitled Revisiting... uh, lambs to the slaughter, or a sheep to the slaughter, revisiting that. I think that's the title. And maybe we'll put it in the links if you want to look at it, uh, if you have 
time and you want to look at it a little further, but I'm just going to touch on a little bit of what I talked about there. But here are the psalmists. Maybe this is the background here is that they've, he talks about, he commends God for all he's done for them, how, they've, how he's been with Israel, and then goes and changes, says, but why have you turned away from us? Where, where have you gone? Look at what's happening to us. And there's no indication, reading the psalm, that the Israel was rebelling against him at the time that he was putting this together. Rebelling against God. Or have some big national sins that they're dealing with. There's no indication here of that. Because he says, we have not <laughs> forsaken you. All this stuff has come upon us, all this calamity, but we haven't forsaken you. So what's going on? And this psalm is quoted by the Apostle Paul. Yet for your sake we are killed all day long, verse 22. For your sake we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Very powerful. But what does the psalmist say to him? What does the psalmist say? Verse 23. Awake! Why do you sleep, O Lord? Why do you hide your face? And forget our affliction and our oppression. Now, <laughs> there must be emotion behind these verses. I don't think he's expressing contempt, but he's certainly having trouble, and he may even be angry or confused or something that is going on. That's why this is happening. So he has... Here he's going to God and taking it right to him, saying, why? Awake! Get out of bed, God. Get out of your slumber. You know, get some coffee and what's going on? Is really maybe the one way of trying to reinterpret it. So, I mean, the psalmist begins by acknowledging all the former experiences of God's power and goodness to the, to the fathers, as I was talking about. The victories they had and will have in God's name. They have not forgotten forsaken the Lord all day long. They praise your name forever. But you cast us off and put us to shame. And you do not go out with our armies. In verse, verse 9. So I'm going to repeat that. What he's talking about here historically is many were slain and prisoners of war sold as slaves. They didn't go out with their armies anymore. They were in trouble. The nation was in trouble because of their enemies. They were humiliated in defeat. And they were slaughtered and taunted and ridiculed. We're not talking about bad economic times here, brethren. We're talking about something quite serious that is going on. This is what he's appealing to. And no wonder he's going to him. Why, what's going on? Why, why, are we, why are you forsaking us? Why are you treating us this way? Why are you allowing this to happen? We haven't forsaken the commandment. And he's coming to God with it. You know, why such waste? Why such waste? They could not understand God's intent which is often only known to him. And sometimes it remains that way. And we need to accept that. So one should carefully study Psalm 44. Psalm 44 is no indication that God was displeased or was handing down punishment. He had other purposes. But despite the affliction, the psalmist did, does remain patient and he says, we have not forsaken the commandment. We're not going to start forsaking the commandment because of these circumstances. He says it right here. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Verse 17. So maybe the reality is here in looking at this. And I think this psalm weighs into the discussion in my opening statement. Is it wrong? to be angry or displeased with God or to be bewildered and not know what's going on and maybe never knowing what's going on. But even for no apparent reason at all, the believers must have at times discouragement and bewilderment. It sounds like God says, you're going to need this. 
you are going to need times of discouragement and bewilderment. It's part of my flock. But that is in, he's talking about here, but it seems like it's in defeat. It seems as though. But God is victorious even in defeat. And if he's victorious, so are we. Are we not? And we should never really project ourselves also as victims, straight out victims. I don't think he's not exactly doing that here. But saying for your sake. He's still giving God the, somehow the benefit of the doubt. But it doesn't that doesn't make it any, any any easier, does it? We don't want to be victims. This is often what I hear. In times of so grief and sorrow can be expressed, but the long game we need to think about too. The long game must not be expressed in victimhood for the rest of our, our lives. That's not the call. So I think it is welcomed to get frustrated with God and express. I think he welcomes it. It's not something he always enjoys, I'm sure. <laughs> I saw something, this is what I appreciate the most, is when you come to me and to tell me how frustrated you are. But I think it is welcomed at times, from time to time. Most, most hopefully not, hopefully most of the time it's not this way. But at times, it seems to be necessary. Otherwise, we would just be religious Androids, just religious androids, and I think there's a lot of them around. I don't want to be a religious android or something, a robot. That doesn't, to me, make for a good relationship. You don't want a relationship with your computer or some machine, even if it has artificial intelligence. Do you want a relationship with that? There are movies that do these kinds of things. It's also been said that those who have no doubts, no doubts at all about their, in their belief system, it's, it's in general, okay? Christianity, or Judaism, or Hinduism, or Islam, okay? It's been said that those who have absolutely no doubts, no frustrations with their deity, even believers in their secular environments, okay? believers in, in secular things, okay? if they have no doubts, no frustrations, and no confusion or wonderment, or some things that cause them to think deeply about what they really believe in, whether it is even true, to really explore these things, what these belief systems are about, but if we don't get those times, we become zealots for fanatics and do great harm. And if you think about it for a bit, you, they certainly do. Fanatics. To be fanatical. They do a lot of harm in society. Speaking in general, whether it could be Christian could be even a Sabbatarian. But we're not here to become fanatics or androids. We're here to have and explore a relationship with God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and a relationship with creation and a relationship with each other. And that just doesn't happen by mere dictates. It doesn't happen that way. And this is what we're exploring. So I've seen a lot of self-assured preachers, and I've talked about this before. You know, these religious elites must hold up this facade, and doing so, they can doing so they, they can end up and have really disappointed people, because it turns out it wasn't as they were not as confident as you thought they were for the things that they believed in and were so fanatical about, and had to couldn't allow any expression of doubt caused others to become fanatical. And it, 
it's just the real thing. And I think you just have to ask yourself the question, have you, have you witnessed this kind of stuff before? If we're going to have a real relationship with God, we are going to struggle with him. It's just the way it is, individually and collectively. And we struggle with each other too, don't we? This is what we do. And, and in all honesty and transparency, Darren and I struggle with each other at times. If we don't, then it's, we don't really have a relationship. So Darren and I have had some disagreements. But we care and love each other deeply and our families respectively. It's always worked out for a better relationship and for a better work. And we need to be thanking God for that. These things occur and these things happen. And we're the better for it. Hope Darren feels the same way. I mean, how would you react to a teacher who openly expressed his qualms with God? Came up and started, got up on the lectern there and started complaining about God and, and why he isn't helping us and you know, we've done all this work and we don't have any money or just whatever. How would you feel? Would it be a difficult thing to accept for his own personal difficulties? Does that change anything? Just to just, just asking you, how would you react? I'm not about to do that today, by the way, because you're concerned about that. And it has also been said that God perhaps has his own reasons his own reasons, and let's get this, for denying us certainty, denying us certainty with regards to his presence and what is going on, say, in nature, or what is going on in our life. Let me say that again. He may, he probably has, perhaps he has his own reasons for denying us certainty on all these things. And it's regards to his presence and what is going on in nature. Now, don't take what I just said too far. We have faith in God. We know he has a plan, and we may not fully understand the plan, and that's what I'm dealing with. He's got maybe plans, and he's got things he's working on with us as individuals. And we don't necessarily operate under those conditions with absolute certainty. I don't. How about you? And we see evidence of this because Christ tells us only the Father himself knows, knows the day of his return. He's kept that to himself. And he's got reasons for it. He'll say he'll come like a snare on the whole earth. You watch therefore you don't know when your master comes. You better find you doing something. And I think that's that in itself is a blessing. So if anybody comes and tells you with absolute certainty such and such a day is going to occur, uh, when people get very dogmatic about prophecy and they say all these things, that they keep adjusting and adjusting about what is going to occur and when. And this or this particular event points to exactly what's happening here in the scripture. If somebody sent me an email and they just keep on inserting different, they look at the prophecies of the Old Testament and then they insert America in there and and I'm like, you know, these big, long rants. And that's not what I want to be a part of. I don't want to be a part of these kinds of things. I study prophecy. We've talked about prophecy here. But you know, dogmatic rants with all coming across with so much certainty. Because people want, some people gravitate towards those who are uh, super confident and deal with certainty and they want to be told what to do and what to believe and I'm not in that camp and then I'm not even here to tell you what, what it is you need to believe because what we're doing here is exploring something and I trust that you have God's Holy Spirit and, and the Bible says the word of God says not me it will lead you and Jesus Christ says it will teach you all things lead you all, all things all things you need to know and hopefully we're helping that along here. Christ
Christ even said in Luke chapter 2 and verse 42, Father, and well, you know what I'm going to say. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your, yours be done. He did not say this just for show. You know, I'm going to set a little example here that for the brethren, I'm going to say these words so that they understand it's God's will, not their will, that must be done. No, it's beyond that. He did not say these words just for show. It would be disingenuous. He actually really meant these words. If you're willing, take this cup away from me. This was a real experience. I mean, even in his most private prayers, we're not privy to. What did he say? What did he petition God for? A lifetime of tears and prayers and going to God as it was written in Hebrews, and we talked about this before, who was able to deliver him. And that was not just in Gethsemane. It was any other time. I mean, in his most private prayers, we would be shocked to say, well, Father, whose idea was this in the first place? We would be shocked. So it was this very tense time and it's very a serious situation is going on there. Yeah, they're going to have dialogue. Some of it we're not privy to. These things we're exploring. Now, if Christ did not experience doubt, not, not doubt in the sense that, well, God exists or not, is my Father holy or not, and not, not, not don't, let's, don't, let's not go too far with these things, but if he did not express some doubt, like we just seen here, you know. But you know, are you sure there wasn't another way? Or conflict. And he probably had to deal with a lot of personal conflict. Then if he didn't have experienced these things, how could then he be a savior? He had to experience the human condition, and that's a big part of the human condition. I hope you agree. We recall the famous statement near the end of his life, calling out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, I know there's a fellow who refused to accept that Christ was actually forsaken, that God had to turn his back on him for for a short while because Christ took on all the sins of the, of the world. And he didn't think that was right or something that didn't accept that. And it doesn't really matter too much how you much might believe about that. Regardless, even so, he was made to feel forsaken. And there again is our condition. He, he didn't say it for show. It wasn't recorded for show. It was recorded and he said it for a reason. And he was being authentic. And we want to be authentic too. Not create religious facades. And it must have been a very acute situation. Because Jesus and God have been together for eternity. And then this moment occurs. All right. When you look at, say, James, James, it almost would sound as though James would feel differently about this. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. But I doubt it. I don't think he would feel differently. Because if we read between the lines of what he's saying, count it all joy, a trial is not a trial unless there is, in fact, angst. Unless there is... The trial is not a trial unless there's, if there's no frustration, if there's no bewilderment. The trial is not a trial when we go, we, we do not say, why God, why? Why is this happening to me? What did I do? These are things we need to be honest about. 
When he speaks of joy, I think he's speaking of the very high level of joy that comes through it. If we look deep inside and look hard at our beliefs, as I was talking before, we're not going to be fanatics here. We're not going to be fanatics and unbalanced unless we have explore these things, even the same way the psalmist had to look very deep within ourselves, which is what God wants us to do. Let's continue on here. There is an acceptance in Judaism of arguing with God and having an emotional and intellectual honesty alongside faith that has been enabling them as part of their survival for so many years. This is what also has been, been said. This is not something that I've, I've dreamt up. This comes from another Jewish scholar. And we see this being played out in Scripture. Say, for example, we have Abraham making the case with God to spare innocent people in Sodom, for example. Okay? This is before Israel, but we see Abraham debating with God, trying to find a way to get him to... He kept reducing the numbers on God. That's an interesting exchange. And then we have Jacob, of course. We have to cover him here, right, for this, for this message, who had a lot of issues he was struggling with being the kind of guy he was, the deceiver. And, so be it, in Genesis chapter 32, he gets into a scrap with God. So let's read uh, a little bit about what's going on here. So Genesis 32 and verse 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. That's what it says. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. So, <laughs> so it was a, a long scrap, a long wrestling match. And I don't know if what kind of, what the nature of it was entirely. And um, But if I guess they're, if they're fighting, <laughs> I don't know if Jacob was, felt he was fighting for his survival or what was going on. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob. He said it will be, it will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And I think about this. It is not normal. I, I can't imagine it being normal in a sparsely populated area because he was alone and he was traveling to get to, to meet with his brother Esau. And that was giving him a lot of angst and, and concern and and these kinds of things. But a very spot, sparsely populated area to bump into someone and then just get into a fight. It almost sounds funny. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. <laughs> There's absolutely there's no context of how this, this, is, this has come about. So I always found this, this is like, what's going on? It's kind of a bewilderment in a sense. And I wonder, there was some issues there needing to scrap about. I don't know. You know, background was Jacob was obviously having doubts and fear with his upcoming encounter with his brother. And he, and he in his life, is already, even just earlier, had, previous, had direct contact with God and reassurance from God that he'll be with him and he'll protect him. And even Jacob then was having fear and doubts. And that should be a little bit of a comfort to us because I haven't had a direct conversation with God it doesn't take away, by the way, having God's Holy Spirit and who speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. I'm not taking away from that. But it would seem a little, it seems a little bit unfathomable as if God himself you know, came and told me something and then I not exactly accept or believe it. So it should be somewhat of a comfort for us in our own struggle. 
So here's the question. Who started this fight? Who started the fight? You know how it is when the parents come, the principals come. Well, he started it. You know, the Bible is silent about this. And sometimes when the Bible is silent about something, there's a reason. There's probably was something that was going on when this started this. <laughs> this, this wrestling match or whatever was going on. But it would appear that God decided he wanted to scrap with Jacob, otherwise he wouldn't have shown up. So perhaps God picked the fight in order to achieve a greater goal. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which means struggles with God. And I think this story, you can interpret it how you'd like, but in writing my notes, I just said, you know, this what this story how it comes to me, expresses an honesty, an honesty of some kind. It expresses an honesty. And I just want you to think about that. I mean, we, 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 we need to be honest with ourselves and with God. And that sometimes could lead to difficult conversations with our, within ourselves and, and with God himself, if we're honest. The other day I wanted God to to test my sincerity to him and what I was saying. What's my, I, you know, I ask him to just, you know, explore and help me understand, am I actually being sincere in what I'm saying? Because I have those doubts, you know, am I saying something? Uh, how sincere am I in expressing these things? And there's times that I don't think we always are, are we? But we, the, the story here expresses the honesty. And the book of Job also expresses an honesty as well. And looking what he experienced and what God had intended. And if we look at the Bible story as a whole, just about all the characters are presented with flaws in it, in them. Abraham had flaws, Jacob had flaws, and all. And there's other things that have occurred here that, that are, you know, are, are difficult. There's a certain honesty. We won't go into too much, uh, really, any more detail than that. But they're presented with flaws. So it cannot be said that the Bible is written from a biased point of view. It's not. It doesn't have a, a Jewish bias. It doesn't have a Christian bias. It's, it's, not, doesn't, it's not presented with a bias. as, say, other religions might be presented. And brethren are taught to be honest with one another. We share each other's you know, the faults with one another. And that takes trust and a lot of relation, good relationship. Because in my years as a believer, and hopefully yours, it's honesty with myself and honesty with God that leads to development. To understand where you've failed and understand where you've succeeded. This is, I think, an important lesson in all this. And going to God with our grievances is a part of that honesty. Don't try to hide them. Take them to him. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him, because he cares about you. All right. Humble yourselves before him. This is in the name, this is the name and sake of reverence that he can take it all on. Humble yourself before him to know that his power, he can take it all on all those cares and anxieties. He's God and he can take it all on. There's nothing you can't, he can't handle. So he cares about you. Cast, casting, okay? Casting your cares upon him. Now this word casting, it basically means to throw, like to throw away. Throw it at him. Get rid of it, is, is, is really what this expression is saying. 
these anxieties. It does not say to share the cares with him. It says to cast your cares on him. It's been said, I've heard before, when you cast your cares, don't cast your cares on and then leave, keep on holding on to it. Hear God and then keep one hand on the thing. It says to actually cast your cares upon him. Which may seem a little unfathomable because these are cares or these anxieties. But you got to do it, including all the things we've been talking about here. Your disappointments, your anger, your bewilderment, your doubts, and all the deep, ugly things that that psychiatrist or the therapist was talking about. If we're going to have a relationship. Because he can take it. He can take it and he can help us. We need to do this. He says to give it up and throw it away. Your anxieties, your, anxieties, your frustrations, everything. I don't think there's a, a particular limit that is being put on us here. And for me, I'm saying this. And Peter's saying this. But I know that takes work. And one way of looking at it is... If you cast it away, but you haven't quite, you keep doing it and keep doing it until it's gone, until you've really punted it. To use a football reference. And I have to work on this. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I do this all the time. It's great. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I certainly, I wouldn't be honest. It takes a lot of work for me to do this. Or you just have to let it go. Hand it over to God, and that takes some process. It could be a process. We've got to give ourselves that space. It takes a lot of trust, and it means you have to have a relationship with someone to do that. Don't do it because Peter tells you to. Peter assumes something here. He's writing on the basis that there is a relationship. That there is a relationship. One that where God participates in our sufferings. We are asked to participate in his, to participate in Christ's sufferings, so then he's particip participating in ours. This, I believe. So we're looking to have an honest expression with God. We don't want to be fanatic. We don't want to hide behind some religious facade and hold it up to God and to everyone else all the time. This is not what we're called to do. It's not, the Bible is written that way. We see the faults. We see our Savior calling out to his Father. And no other religious system does this. So, we're going to wrap it up now. There is the our great high priest... Let's read what it says here in Hebrews. Therefore, since we have, have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but, but one who has been tempted in every way, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, honesty, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. We really have to embrace and believe that. So brethren, I hope that it was helpful today and maybe somewhat challenging on some levels. I don't know. To me, I get, <laughs> I'm get i challenged and confronted by Scripture often and, and, and reading and understanding and uh, we need to uh, explore those things. And let's hope to do it together. So with that, I'll, I'm going to sign off once again. You know, check out the, the website. You can download the magazine. I, for, I neglected to say. You can download the PDF and, and read through it. And uh, I hope again it will be a blessing. I hope you like the cover. You know, 
looks it's, it's colorful. It's a winter scene. And if you look in the way in the background, you can see sheep. How's that? <laughs> so I'm going to sign off. Thanks again for joining us. And we'll see you next time here on Shepherd's Voice magazine. Until then, take care.